Today on the Pets Ed Life podcast, Chris freaks his cat out with his radio voice. <laughs> I think that's every day, but we'll we'll say yes on on this day as well. Um, we've got some great guests, some great stories, and some great product recommendations. So crank that volume, stay tuned, and enjoy. Pets Ad Life, your guide to the latest in pet trends, products, and the joy of the human-animal bond with Kristen Levine and Chris Bonifati, powered by the American Pet Products Association and Dog TV. So Chris, is Tiger under the bed today? I think so. I think she is. Uh, She uh, does not like it when I speak with other people. It's quite funny because she really likes to talk to me. I think we've really built a rapport together over these (laughs) last couple of years. Um, But as soon as I start speaking into the microphone, it is run away, hide, and act like I don't exist. It's off-putting for a cat. (laughs) I suppose so, yeah. Actually, my voice tends to be off-putting to a lot of people. So if you've already made it this far into the episode, thank you. Uh, We're in good shape. please don't make fun of my voice. We're in good shape. So we're we're here on our second episode, Chris. And uh, just to remind our audience, uh, the format that we have here at Pets Ed Life is to share two pet stories two of our favorite pet products. Chris does one, I do one. And then uh, we have uh, audience Q&A. What did I miss? Oh, the guests. Of course, we have these fabulous guests that join us too. Don't forget about the guests. Kristen and Chris present Storytime. All right, so my story for the week is this. So I just heard this this morning that uh, Dave Portnoy from Barstool Sports, he adopted a rescue dog named Miss Peaches. She is a, I think they said she's four years old. She's a four-year-old pit bull mix, came from a really awful, awful home that where it was like a bad breeding and hoarding situation. She was rescued by, I believe it was called Lifeline Animal Project. And um, Dave had been looking for a dog to adopt and somehow they connected and he adopted her. But the amazing thing is, she has blown up the internet, Miss Peaches. Like every social channel that Barstool has has blown up because of her. And they started uh, an, an Instagram uh, account for her. And in one week, Chris, she amassed 247,000 followers. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it's – it's a, an, a, I, I had a similar celebrity story last week, um, but I just love to see people that have a big platform promoting important things like pet adoption and rescue. And um, he even went one step further and created a whole line of uh, Miss Peaches merch that uh, all the proceeds, <laughs> <laughs> all the proceeds benefit uh, the Lifeline Animal Project, and also they partnered up with Jet Wag Animal Rescue, which I'm I'm going to assume Jet Wag is one of those uh, organizations that flies uh, pets that need homes to areas of the country that where there's more demand for them. So great, yeah, I that's that a that's cool. a great story. I mean. First of all, to become a celebrity overnight like that for Miss Peaches must be incredibly overwhelming. <laughs> so wishing Miss Peaches the best in what must be a busy and turbulent time uh, for their life. Uh, but but good on good on Dave to uh, really bring to light the the joys of animal adoption. And uh, I've seen I've actually seen some of that uh, stuff. And just the way he talks about the dog, you could see he genuinely cares. You could see that little bit of sparkle in his eyes when he talks about it. And, um, for those of you considering, uh, getting a pet yourself, just look at Dave. If if it could warm his ice cold heart, it could warm yours. (laughs) Be like Dave. (laughs) Be like Dave. With pets, that is. Yeah. Yeah. With pets. (laughs) Uh, my story is kind of in the same vein, actually. Um, it is about, um, a, a, uh, an organization that was called the Animal Rescue Foundation. They're now known as Joybound. Um, and I want to talk about a specific program that they run called Pets and Vets. Um, we had Steve Feldman on last episode talking about the science behind the healing nature of pets. And some of that research has informed us that animals are really good for people with PTSD. Mm, uh, yeah. And so... I'm, I'm not going to talk about a specific uh, person who's used the Pets and Vets uh, platform because they tend to try and, you know, hide their identities because it sure. can be incredibly overwhelming. But I really do just want to call attention to this program. Um, the way it works is they bring in all sorts of animals. They are just a standard rescue foundation uh, based out of California. They bring in all sorts of different animals and they attempt to train their best mannered dogs to uh, be this 
highest possible level of service animal. And not every dog makes the cut. And that's that, that's the case. Those who don't just get adopted out to yeah. a normal family and, and into a loving home. But those that uh, can, they get matched up directly with a, a veteran who is struggling uh, coming home and dealing with PTSD. And they have found that it has helped um, many people. Their latest press release uh, uh, says that they have helped um, they, they just say hundreds, hundreds of, of veterans uh, supported by a volunteer corps, 480 different people. Wow. It's an incredible program, a huge effort to help these uh, people who, who represent uh, the United States military come home and are having a difficult time adjusting. Sure. Uh, so it really just shows you the, the, the beautiful and powerful healing nature uh, that having a, a companion uh, when you're feeling incredibly lonely can have. So uh, for anybody out there who may be listening, who may be suffering from even just loneliness, right, or or any sort of uh, depression, mental health disorder, the science has shown that animal companionship to help. So if you feel up to it, uh, take a look at some of the resources that these beautiful foundations can offer, and it, it might be a good fit for you. Yeah, and along those loneliness lines, in that uh, interview that we did with Steve Feldman last week, he also talked about the foster cat the program with the uh, independently living elderly. And after after a year of living with the cats that they adopted, they had their loneliness yeah. scores just completely dropped off. So Exactly. So yeah. I'm not going to say it's great for everybody. You know, you definitely yeah. need, uh, you know, to do your research and things like that. But if you feel like you're somebody out there who, who needs a friend, who needs a companion, consider it. Uh, look at the resources around you in your community, Visit your local shelter, your local SPCA, and and see if it clicks for you because it could be life changing. So Absolutely. just consider it. And it's called Joybound. Joybound, Joybound? is the new name. Joybound. They just okay. they just recently uh, rebranded. So you could find more about their organization at Joybound. One word: Joybound dot org. That's a great find, Chris. Thanks. Beyond the leash, exploring the untold stories of pet passion and professionalism. All right, from our stories to our first guest today, uh, Jeremy Baker. He is the Chief Growth Officer at the American Pet Products Association, and I took a look at his background, and he's got about 140 dog years experience in the pet industry. So uh, he has a real passion for pet care, and that makes him a perfect fit for our show today. Jeremy, it's an honor to have you with us. Hey, good morning. Pleasure to be with you guys. It's uh, an exciting day, so looking forward to, to our conversation today. It's uh it's a great industry to get the opportunity to speak about. And so uh, really excited for our uh, time today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I have to ask you just probably the easiest question first, because this is what everybody wants to know about our guests, is tell us about your pets. Oh, man. Well, <clears throat> you know, that, that's a long story, but I'll try to keep it quick. <laughs> um, you know, my first pet was a black lab. And, uh, oh. you know, when I moved to Chicago, uh, Blaze was our, was our first pet my wife and I got when we were married. And, you know, it's typical that you really want to move to the 15th floor of a high rise and then get a black lab that has more energy than <laughs> anything else. Uh, but, uh, that was our first pet. And so Blaze has since passed and, and we, you know, started the new journey with kids. And so we've got three kids. I won't call them pets, but at times I think of them as such, but, uh, <laughs> So really, our pets, uh, our pets in the household are actually more of our kids' as pets at this point. And so right, we're right. not your traditional, uh, we're not your traditional pet owner, though. Um, you know, we don't have the dogs and the cats. Uh, we we kind of fall in that specialty category of pet ownership. And uh, so we've got uh, three different categories of pets that, that are in our household today. And uh, my oldest son, uh, you know, he started with uh, reptiles. And so uh he since moved on to fish. So he is an aquatics uh, fan. So he has two different types of uh, fish tanks, but one's an African cichlid tank. Uh, wow. which, uh, I won't, I won't go on and name the names of the, of the fish. Cause I don't know that we've <laughs> gone to that point, but, um, <laughs> but uh, he's got a cichlid tank. And then uh, my middle son, he's, he's also a reptile fan. And so he's got a leopard get go and uh, that one does have a name. And so, He's a huge football fan, and so for those that are football fans would, would recognize, but he's gone after the name of Alan Lazard uh, for his <laughs> and, uh And then my daughter, yeah, who's our youngest, uh, she has a pet that is her uh, beta fish, or beta, however we want to refer to it in this industry, but uh, and, and her beta fish is named Angel. So 
And then, you know, I argue daily on, on who this other pet uh, is, you know, ownership of. So we'll call it a family pet. But uh, we've got a, a rabbit and, and uh, our rabbit's name is Joy. And so, uh, you know, we caught across the, uh, the specialty specter, spectrum, we kind of have all of them covered. So. You sure do. You just, all you need now is a horse. <laughs> You know what? Uh, my 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 uh, my stepdad has a horse, and so we'll let the kids go over to their place and enjoy okay. the enjoy the horse. We'll let that count, and and that's great. Yeah, that's one great. of those things that uh, it's it's like a boat. You don't really want to own it. You just want to know somebody <laughs> with it. <laughs> lots yeah, of that's lots a good of point. upkeep and expense and maintenance with the horse. Indeed, that's a good point. Indeed. Yeah, I couldn't okay, agree awesome. More, so. Well, I love that you have that variety of pets because most of the folks we talk to have dogs and cats, but so many of, of you know, of our pet owners that are listening do have reptiles, fish, small animals and things like that. So that's, that's great to hear. So let's, let's dive in a little bit more to your role with the American Pet Products Association. I'm wondering if you can tell our listeners what new pet solutions they can look forward to seeing either in stores or online um, a little bit later on this year. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is a really exciting time for, for all of us at APPA as we, you know, get ready to move into one of our largest products, which is Global Pet Expo. And, you know, for those that aren't aware of what Global Pet Expo is, you know, it's, it's our, our opportunity to bring the industry together and, and debut and showcase many of those great products that will, will be ultimately moving the industry ahead over the years to come. So, you know, Global Pet Expo this year is going to feature over 1,100 companies exhibiting. Uh, when we start to think about some of that and we break it down, you know, there's going to be over 99 companies that are in the what's new section for, for Global Pet Expo. Wow. Uh, we've got over 330 new companies this year that will be first time attendees that, you know, typically in many ways are, are new companies that are starting up and bringing new products to the industry as well. And if you go to another one of our aspects of what, you know, is exciting at Global Pet Expo, it's our innovation and motion section. And our innovation and motion section this year is going to completely re-envision to, to really help us evolve the future of where the industry is going at large. But a big part of that innovation and motion section is still going to be the new product showcase. And our new product showcase is, is one of the, the premier events of the industry for companies to come and debut their new products and kickstart their initiatives and in moving those products forward in the industry. You know, we're anticipating over 1,200 new products being debuted this year at the new product <laughs> wow. showcase. So, you know, needless to say, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, evolution to what's going on in this industry. But if we, you know, really start to break that down and, and dig into it a little bit further, you know, this, this industry is a massive industry, right? I mean, it's a $150 plus billion dollar industry. And so, you know, we could spend an entire podcast, you know, probably talking mm -hmm. about what are what are the new things that are evolving and and, and, and shaping our space. And and uh, but if I if I keep it pretty high level, um, you know, I, I think you know there are probably five to six different things that I would say that we're we're likely going to continue to see at Global. And um, and I think you know within each of these, there, there's going to be emergences of things that will will stick, and there'll probably be things that will fade away as trends, right? But, um, you know, I think one of the things we've really seen um, is, is the continued evolution in the supplement space. And I think we're going to continue to see, you know, supplements explode. Um, there's a lot of new startups coming on board and really rethinking the supplement space. Um, you know, if you go back 10 years ago, supplements were pretty simple in, in the sense that, you know, it was really a gluco glucose, 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 geez, I can't, can't speak this morning, but glucose mean <laughs> and, and for the morning. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, you know, hip and joint or something to that extent. And if you if you start looking at the progression of where we're going now, I mean, there's a supplement that really kind of deals with almost any ailment that a pet is is, is facing. And, um, you know, I think within that supplement space, obviously, there's a large emergence and evolution to what we're seeing with CBD enter, enter, entering, entering the space as well. And, you know, for pain management and other types of um, aspects around the supplement space. So I think supplements will be probably one of the exciting areas. Our new product showcase is always featuring a tremendous amount of new companies bringing new ideas and solutions on board uh, within the supplement space. Um, you know, I think if we, you know, continue to grow from, from that aspect, um, functional. Uh, so functional kind of crosses over a number of different categories and products. Um, you know, but I think what we're seeing is, is that consumers are looking for convenience in ways which make their lives easier. And so when we look at the products at which they're you know, offering their pets, functionality becomes critical. So 
whether that's functional treats, right? In the past, it used to be a treat. Well, now I'm offering a treat that, you know, maybe helps with uh, dental, uh, maybe helps with digestion, maybe helps with some of these other aspects. So that's, you know, what we refer to kind of in the functional space. And, you know, on the topic of treats, I mean, that's one of our largest growing categories at the show. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of new exhibitors at the show that will be function, you know, featuring a tremendous amount of new products um, in the treat space. Uh, you know, I think when we talk about functionality, the supplement space we already touched on, but again, functional supplements and then in the foods as well. Right. I mean, we've gone from, you know, the food space in the, in the, in the days of old being, you know, just a kibble with uh, byproducts and miscellaneous ingredients that a lot of people really didn't understand what they were to, you know, evolution now with, with companies in the dog food space, bringing, you know, nutrition forward that helps eliminate allergens and, and the pet which is one of our biggest issues with pet ownership, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of evolution in the functionality of products, uh, I think is going to be another trend that we'll, we'll likely see. Uh, and that I think ties in with unique novel ingredients. Um, so, you know, this industry continues to amaze me with the ingredients at which we identify to be able to put into products and and continue to evolve the, the nutrition for our pets. And, you know, uh, for me, it's, it's hard to wrap my head around some of these things, but, um, you know, you've got a lot of unique novel ingredients that are coming online. And I think you can almost look to the health space uh, for human health and you'll see a Mm -hmm. lot of those similar trends following its way into the pet space. But, you know, proteins such as cricket, you know, meal, black, black fly larva, you know, there's just so many different types of ingredients that are are flowing into um, the, the, the spaces. Yeah. The supplements and novel proteins are perfect examples of those flowing from the human world to the pet world. And, this is why I'm one of the reasons I'm so excited uh, that we have this show now um, with Pets Ad Life is because prior to now, uh, I just don't really know that there were many outlets for the average pet parent to know what's coming, what's coming down the line. But I mean, they, they see it in the store, they see it online, but they don't maybe get all of the educational background about why it's coming, why it's being introduced now. And so I'm really excited um, that here at Pets Ed Life, we're going to be able to kind of give, give folks a sneak peek of what's coming and, and educate them about what to be looking for. Absolutely. I think that's one of the responsibilities that we feel is part of American Pet Product Association is to, you know, be that connector and to help inform, you know, people with, with, within the industry and outside of the industry as to how the industry is evolving and changing and how it impacts them. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things that we're really excited about continuing to evolve and, 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 you know, we're certainly excited about, uh, about these podcasts. Awesome. Yeah. You know, for those of you who um, may be listening or watching at home, Global Pet Expo is a B2B trade show. So uh, unfortunately, consumers can't attend, but uh, we have over a hundred influencers attending the show this year. So one of your favorites may be posting about the show. Uh, be sure to look at the hashtag Global Pet Expo to get all of the updates uh, so that you could stay on top of this. There's going to be a lot of new product launches and a lot of new trends being spotted. So uh, even if you're at home, you could still get the the latest and greatest. Absolutely. Very, very true. So Jeremy, I have one more kind of serious question before we put you through our rapid fire questions. <laughs> uh, let's see. So you might want to grab another cup of coffee, you know, because oh, you want to okay. be on it for that. All right. So switching gears here, we, we all know that pets add life. But a lot of people can't have pets or they don't have pets for certain reasons. There are several barriers to having pets that that people encounter. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what the American Pet Products Association is is doing to kind of address those barriers and, and perhaps alleviate some of them. Yeah, you know, that's that's an interesting topic and it's it's a really complex one to really, you know, think about. Um, you know, there there are so many aspects that occur when when you have this large of an industry. And you know, I think the best way for me to really break it down and start to think about it is, you know, one of the products that APPA has uh, had for a while and we're re-envisioning and, and bringing forward uh, a, a new life to is is our National Pet Owner Survey and particularly our strategic insights. And we'll be de- debuting a new version of that at the Global Pet Expo show coming up here in, in 27 days. So uh, that being said, you know, one of the things that we look at and study in there is, you know, what, what are the barriers to pet ownership? What prevents people from owning pets? And there's really, first and foremost, two groups that we have to think about it within. We have a group of individuals that have owned pets that no longer own pets mm-hmm. for some reason. And then we have another group of individuals that have never owned a pet. 
And so within those, you know, as we start to think about those two different groups of individuals, there really kind of becomes three buckets that I like to think about that typically impact their decision making when, when deciding whether or not to have a pet or, or to get another pet. And it's, it's emotional, lifestyle, and financial. And so we've done a lot of research on, on those three areas to kind of understand, you know, why is it that people either, you know, once had a pet and no longer have a pet? Um, you know, why is it that, you know, the people that don't have pets haven't got into pet ownership? I mean, recognizing that, you know, today, I mean, over 66% of households own a pet. So number one, we're doing a really dang good job as an industry. Right. Um, but, uh, but we still have room to grow, right? And we want to make sure that this industry is not just growing, but really it's thriving. And, and I think that that's part of what we're trying to dig into and work on. So, you know, when you think about, you know, those statistics, and, and, it's, and it's really different when you dig into each of the different subcategories of species that we mentioned, right? Dog and cat kind of rule the roost for us in this industry and the specialty segments are, you know, certainly smaller in pet ownership. But, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on there. I mean, I could go down to the topic of generational in the sense of how the generations are evolving and changing um, with pet ownership. You could go into, you know, a number of aspects around um, what, you know, within each of those buckets of emotional lifestyle and financial, what's impacting them. And, you know, we could probably unpack this in a podcast all in itself. But, you know, I guess the first way I'll, I'll kind of start to think about it is that emotional space, right? So emotional, when we think about emotional, um, you know, it, it first and foremost, right, this is tied to someone that had a pet and they lost their pet, right? And, and we all know the grieving process is, is sure. different for everybody, right? And as pets have increasingly become a part of the household, right? They're, they're a family member today. And, you know, we all grieve differently when we lose family members, right? And so, you know, but that's the number one reason, you know, in, in, the, in both sections of the, the emotional side of things as to why people don't get another pet or are concerned about getting a pet is because they're, they're concerned that if this becomes a part of their family, you know, how do I ever let go of this pet, right? So, you know, almost 28% of people responded saying that their number one concern in, in that space is dealing with the lost loved one. Right. Sure. So that's a really tough one for us to probably tackle and think about how do we address. Um, but it's, but it's an important thing to be aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that lifestyle section is the one that we're probably most focused on as an association. And when we start to look into that space, you'll see similarities between the two different groups of individuals that I mentioned, but you know, the number one thing that stands out in both instances there is, <clears throat> is travel. And, um, you know, travel is the number one reason why folks don't have a pet or people that had a pet previously don't have a pet. And so <clears throat> when you think about that particular topic, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're interested in is removing barriers to pet ownership. And so, you know, when we talk about travel, wh wh what is that, right? What, what's, what's preventing people? Well, the number one issue is that we still have a large number of, of hotels or Airbnbs or, you know, places that when I travel that don't allow pets. And so, you know, how do we make that easier for them so that when I travel, I can travel with my pet? So, you know, that would be an example of an initiative that we're, you know, considering, you know, working on in partnership with Habri and, and other groups in the industry to really help remove barriers to, you know, uh, pet ownership. And, and, and that is not only exclusive to the travel aspect, you know, one of the other features that you'll see in our survey is that, <clears throat> surprisingly, a large majority of workplaces don't allow pets in their offices. You know, and if you look at all the studies that we've done and studies we've done in partnership with others in this industry, you'll see the benefits of having a pet in the office, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's nothing factual in nature other than people's resistance to, you know, having that pet in the office or maybe a lease, you know, implies that they can't. So how do we, how do we work to help educate people on, the benefits of pets in the, in, you know, in the household or not in the house, but in the offices. So right, right. lifestyle is just a really big, big, big topic. Um, but, you know, I think those are kind of the two areas around travel that I think really, you know, we were interested in and trying to help, you know, lean into. Yeah. And, and on, on the flip side of travel, um, I know a lot of times people choose to not have a pet because they travel for work frequently and they're concerned about, you know, having the proper care for that, for that pet in their absence. Yeah, so that's absolutely. A, I feel like I'm probably 
the the target demographic that APA is looking at, uh, you know, <laughs> entering my 30s millennial with with with, a, you know, a nice corporate job. And just from experience, the most difficult part of having this cat is finding somebody to watch her when I have to travel for work, which is quite often. Um, right. So, you know, it, send sending your thoughts, sending your ideas, people on, on good uh, pet sitters, because I could definitely use them. Yeah, help us out here. Yeah, yeah Jeremy, that that's it's really great to hear to hear more about you know how App is addressing those barriers and and we just we need more information, right? We need we need to study it a little bit further, make sure we really target our efforts where we can make the most improvement. So I, yeah, I think that's absolutely. really awesome. And, and you know, I think you know, I think one of the things that that we recognize is that you know our responsibility is not to solve this this exclusively by ourselves, right? We can't boil the ocean; it's it's too big of a topic. But you know, what what our play in this is is that we you know we want to gather, we want to inform, and we want to connect, right? And that's yeah. and you've heard me say that before earlier today. And and you know, I think as we think about that aspect, that's the part that we can play you know a significant role in. But we also will make you know moves to to be an early adopter to making change, right? And I think you know we've we've really leaned in and supported a number of great groups that are in this industry that are ultimately helping move this these barriers ahead, right? I mean, you know, we have pets in the classroom for those that haven't heard about pets in the classroom, they need to look it up. It's one of the best programs that I think this industry has that is placing pets in in classrooms and, you know, really helping teachers create connections with the kids and, you know, promoting responsible pet ownership and the care for pets and responsibility and all the things that come with it. You know, so pets Mm -hmm. in the classroom is is a partner of ours that we lean into and support, you know, we've got obviously Habri, um, you know, Human Animal Bond Research Institute. You know, they're leading with evidence-based um, science and, and really tackling big topics with science, uh, which is which is certainly important. And, you know, we, we certainly lean in and really want to support the initiatives that they're working on. And another great one that we've leaned into is, is Joybound, right? I mean, um, a lot of people don't realize, but, uh, you know, Joybound's an organization out there, and there are other organizations as well that really lean into supporting veterans and, and first responders and placing pets with them to help them overcome some of their personal issues and challenges that they're dealing with. And it just goes back to the research and the science that Havri's leading the way with that, you know, the human-animal bond is something that's real, and, and it helps people in ways that we can't even begin to describe you know, but there are other things, right? And and I think, you know, those are ones that we continue to support and we'll continue to lean into. But I think as we think about APPA for the future, you know, one of the things that I really feel strongly about is that we got to be a change agent and, and we lean in and we start creating opportunities. And when those things start getting traction, then we move on to the next thing. And I think another great example of that, that we've leaned into in the past was Bark at the Park, right? If you go back 12, 15 years ago, people weren't bringing pets to stadiums with them, right? And if you go back to some of the topics we were talking about earlier, which is why do people, you know, not own pets? It's travel. It's I'm on the go. I've got to, you know, be going different places. We saw that, right? And so we partnered with a couple others in the industry and we launched Bark at the Park and started allowing pet stadiums to bring pets to the to the different stadiums. And, you know, we now, you know, see that as something that cemented itself and it, and it, it spreads like wildfire, right? Like those are the types of initiatives that we're going to lean into is that we'll be the change agent. We'll get something going and then let them have their life of their own. Right. And so, you know, those are some of the different aspects that we're really passionate about and, and think there's great opportunity to continue to support. I believe it's time for us to move into some uh, rapid fire questions. I don't know if we have an intro for this, so I'm just going to give a r- 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 rapid fire round. Uh, so Kristen, why don't you take us away as we drill uh, Jeremy for his most important opinions. Okay, Jeremy, don't take time to think about this. You just got to jump in there with the answer. Okay, first one is reptiles or birds. I got to go reptiles. You are an, on an outing with your dog that you just adopted. Are you at the mount? Are you in the mountains or are you on the beach? I am absolutely going to be up in the mountains. I, I love love the mountains. Okay. And what's a favorite thing one of your pets does? So you, you obviously you've got reptiles, you've got bunnies, you've got fish. What is one favorite thing that one of them does? Yeah. You know, Joy, our rabbit is, is probably our favorite. I, I, when kids come over to our house, it's amazing. I mean, Joy is like a therapy animal. I mean, you, you've seen kids that have never seen a rabbit before, didn't realize that rabbits could be a pet. And when Joy nestles up in your neck and kind of just, you know, almost gives you a hug, 
uh, you know, it, it brings something warm to your heart, you know, whether that's with our own kids or, or kids that are over at our house visiting. I mean, it's just a, it's a special thing that when you see kids connect with pets and, you know, especially little fluffy, you know, ones that are <laughs> that are so cuddly and you just want to you know, squeeze, you know, it's it's irresistible. It's right. Bunnies are irresistible. OK, how about the least favorite thing that one of your pets does? Oh boy, you know, uh, cleaning up uh, the, the leopard gecko cage is kind of gross, and, and you know, <laughs> I, I just, you know, that's that's not a chore of mine these days. But uh, you know, helping my son, you know, clean that cage, it's it's uh, we'll just leave it that way. It's it's a little gross. <laughs> okay, uh, I can smell it now. Uh, who gets more affection in your home, your pets or your wife? Oh man, that's a trick question. I don't feel like I can answer that one the right way. Uh, but for <laughs> it's me, a it's a trap. Yeah, it is. It's got to be the wife. It's got to be the wife. Because, you know, as I said before, the pets are technically my kids. So right. that's a very <laughs> smart answer. The pet can't understand it. The wife definitely would would listen <laughs> and and be able to react. You're exactly. a wise man. I know safe she'll listen answer. to this podcast. Too, so hopefully I'm safe now. Oh, she's a fan of the show. That's great. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jeremy, we so appreciate you taking some time to chat with us today. We'll let you get back to work. We know you got a big show coming up, so uh, get back at it. And uh, thanks again for being with us. Thanks for the time, guys. Really appreciate it. Yep. We'll see you in Florida. All right. Looking forward to it. See you guys. I can't wait for you to meet Mike Bober. Actually, Chris, you might know Mike Bober. He's the president and CEO know Mike. of yep. the, yeah, the Pet Advocacy, Advocacy Network. <laughs> so his work involves innovating this complex landscape of uh, pet legislation and, and fostering a community that, that values the human-animal bond and ensures that pets get the love and care and respect that they deserve. So he's a true friend to animals. Chris already knows him. And uh, I sat down to speak with him recently, and here he is. Beyond the Leash, exploring the untold stories of pet passion and professionalism. Hello, pet lovers. I've got another great guest for you that I met at the Pet Industry Leadership Summit. This is Mike Bober. Mike, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Certainly. So you are with the Pet Advocacy Network. That's right. Tell our audience what that means, what you do. <laughs> sure. Yeah, the uh, the Pet Advocacy Network is great because the name says what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we advocate for pets. We are the voice of the responsible pet care community. Mm -hmm. Everybody from breeders and distributors of animals to food and product manufacturers, retailers, service providers. Basically, if they're involved in bringing an animal into the world, bringing them into your home or helping you to care for them. Uh, they're folks that we represent in legislative and regulatory settings. That's a big job. An important it is. one though. It is. And it's, it's across the country. It's around the world. Yeah. It's, uh, it's something that, that we feel privileged to have the opportunity to do really. Right. So what are some of the more common issues that you are, that you find yourself, um, you know, advocating for pet businesses, um, mm -hmm product manufacturers and that sort of thing. We, uh, I mean, we like to say ultimately that, that everything that we work on goes back to the issue of pet care. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the beginning and the end right. of it is we want to make sure that we're being responsible stewards of the, the animals that we, we bring into people's lives. Sure. And so we, we work on a wide range of issues, uh, everything from support for, uh, service animals for wounded service members, mm -hmm. uh, support for funding for shelters for women escaping domestic mm -hmm. violence situations. Yeah. Uh, we were a big part of supporting the One Health Initiative, mm -hmm. which is the uh, the belief that human health, animal health, and environmental health are all linked. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for the uh, the various agencies of the government to treat them that way. Right. Now, when was the Advocacy Network started? Uh, we're actually a 50-plus year old really? organization. Oh, Oh my goodness. Uh, for the first 50 years of our life, we were known as the Pet Industry Joint Advisory mm -hmm. Council, but that's a lot of words <laughs> that didn't do a great job of saying what we did. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and it, and it didn't come across clearly either. You could say PJAC and people would start spelling P J A C K, and that wasn't right. right. So about two, three years ago, we sat down and we said, as we head into our next 50 years, we want to do a better job of helping people understand who we are and what we do. Right. And thus the Pet Advocacy Network was born. You know, when I, when I hear about pet advoc advocacy, and maybe this was because my career started out in animal welfare, I, mm -hmm. animal welfare comes to my mind Absolutely. first and foremost. Yeah. So. Well, I, I think that's, again, animal welfare is at the heart of everything that mm -hmm. we do. Um, I, I try to, to help people understand that, that very few people get into anything in the way of a pet-related business 
because they think they're going to make a lot of money doing it. <laughs> right. You know, first and foremost, the reason you get in is because you care about pets. And so, you know, for us to have the opportunity to represent the industry, mm -hmm. to represent the businesses, but also to represent pet owners and mm -hmm. to represent really the pets themselves mm -hmm. in a lot of these key issues across the country is, is tremendous. Yeah. Well, and, and you've sort of answered this already, but I just want to ask it another way for, for our pet lovers that are watching, how does your work impact them directly and their pets? Well, one of the things we like to say is care is care. Mm -hmm. And so for us, if, if animals are, uh, either not being treated well or could be being treated better, mm -hmm. uh, we think that affects everybody. Mm -hmm. And with so many people in our country bringing animals into their lives as a way of combating loneliness and depression and things like that during the pandemic, we're at a unique time in this country right now. We have an opportunity to really engage with people who, in some cases, are first-time pet owners. Mm -hmm. In other cases, have brought an additional pet into their home. Uh, but we're at a point where they have the chance now to say, this is what we've experienced and I need help. Mm. And I understand that. Could I think this we all extend do. to things like pet friendly housing and travel? Oh, very much so. Okay. Yeah. These are, these are issues that, that I think affect everybody at their, their core. You yeah. know, I, I actually had the, the, good fortune, uh, to bring a dog into our, our home at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh -huh. And then when, uh, when the opportunity al allowed us, we actually took him on a road trip cross country. Oh, wow. And I will say that as a, as a pet owner, I had the experience of planning a trip around the pet friendly lodging, the, right. the, the, uh, things like, uh, Doggy, doggy, dog parks and, right. and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it was an eye opening experience. And how about when you want to go to a restaurant when you're on the road oh, with your dog? Oh, I yeah. mean, that's. Dining out with pets is, <laughs> is so important. Yeah. And it's something that pet owners across the country are really asking for in greater yeah. numbers. Yeah. So it's nice to see that a, a lot, that's especially happening at the local level. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot more of the municipal and county level governments addressing that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. I think it, it creates an opportunity for people to really further bond with their pets. Absolutely. Uh, Mike, would you say it's safe to say that things, places and businesses are only going to get pet friendlier as time goes by? I hope so, mm -hmm. uh, both for the sake of pet owners and also for the sake of those businesses. Yeah. Because I think that, that the pet owning public really is a discerning one. Mm -hmm. And it's one that is going to recognize and support businesses that support them. And so I think to the extent that a, a, a smart business owner out there is reading the tea leaves, mm -hmm. they're going to see that, that they do well by doing good. Sure. Absolutely. So I heard you speaking earlier and you talked about you were inviting the folks here at the, at this summit, um, to attend a special event yes. that happens every year on Capitol Hill. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, the, uh, the, the second word in our name is advocacy uh -huh. and advocacy at its heart really just means telling your story. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we try to do every year is to create an opportunity for people who are involved in the pet care community to come to Washington and to help us tell their stories. So so we, we will be hosting the seventh annual DC fly-in, uh, but perhaps even more interesting than that is what happens that evening. Ah. And for almost 30 years now, we've been bringing pets, pet lovers, and, and folks who really can kind of help to tell the story of the power of pets mm -hmm. to Washington for something called Pet Night on Capitol Hill. Fantastic. And that's a great event. It's a chance for uh, staffers, members, everyone to get together and really just celebrate everything about pets that we love. Right. We do the, uh, the Animal Health Institute does the cutest pets on Capitol Hill <laughs> awards. Uh, I don't think there's a single office on the Hill that doesn't enter. Right. And wow. uh, yeah, and we give out other recognition opportunities. We really just, just have a great chance for people to get together and to, to bond over pets. I bet everybody looks forward to that every year because nothing brings us together like pets do, right? It is absolutely one of the most popular events on the legis on the, the congressional uh -oh. calendar. I do. I do not doubt that. That's fantastic. Yeah. One last question for you, Mike, you know, we, I've heard a lot of talk about the human animal bond. We spoke to Steve Feldman, um, on one of the shows. Um, how does the human animal bond play, dovetail into the work that you do? I, I like to say it informs everything we do. Yeah. I mean, the reality is we all know firsthand what pets bring into our lives. 
and the ability and the opportunity to share that information and to back it up with data mm -hmm. is so important and so valuable. So for us to have the opportunity to take the work that a group like Habri does yeah. and to then share it with lawmakers and staff really goes a long way toward helping everybody kind of tie this all back together. And like we said, understand that at the end of the day, pets do add life. Yes, they absolutely do. That's why that's the name of this podcast. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we can all rest easy at night knowing that Mike and his team are doing great work for, for advocating for us and our pets. And thank you so much for doing the great oh, work. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Pets add life. <laughs> Well, it was really great having Mike on the podcast. There's all sorts of things that happen behind the scenes that we're not aware of. So thank you, Mike, for sort of bringing some of these issues to light, talking about the work that you're doing. And uh, if you want to get involved, just go find the Pet Adv Advocacy Network's website, type it into your search bar. It'll be the first thing that comes up and, and see how you could help out. The product of the week. So my product of the week this week uh, comes from a pause, a P A W capital Z pause, and you may have seen some of these. So I I live in the Northeast, and February, uh, which is when when we're recording this this podcast, February is just known for being salty, gross sidewalks of just wintry slush. Um, and not a lot of people are aware, but that kind of mix can be very dangerous for your dog's very sensitive little paws. So if you are a local city slicker who lives <laughs> in an urban environment, uh, that, that gets snow or they salt the roads, you may want to consider some of these, these dog boots. Now, I love I love seeing the videos of the first time the dogs put them on. They start <laughs> kind of walking really weird. They're not used to it. So I will say it it takes some yeah, it takes, just like that. It takes some warming up. It, it's definitely <laughs> not natural for a dog to wear shoes, but it's also not natural for them to be exposed to so much salt. Uh, those are very right. sensitive uh, parts of their body that could get very dry. And it's very difficult to rehydrate them with bombs and, and oils and things like that. So your best bet is to protect your dog's foot with these little rubber booties. Uh, they sort of snap right on, protect the foot. Uh, uh, once you get them into, into understanding that it's to help them, it can be very difficult to put on at first. But I found uh, with my parents' dog that it's become a little bit more uh, natural as, as time has gone on. And, and I think... Uh, the, the dogs really realize the benefit of having their feet protected. Uh, they take longer walks outside in the winters. They enjoy their time a little bit more. And they also uh, won't be picking and scraping and scratching at their own feet, which could cause wounds, which is really what yeah. you want to avoid. So check them out. That's Paws, P-A-W-Z. That's such a great idea because uh, not only does it protect their paws from like what could be corrosive salts and mm -hmm. and. God knows what else is on, on the ground, but also, um, you know, our pets lick their paws. So yep. if they're ingesting whatever that those toxins or chemicals are, that can pose problems beyond, you know, their feet. So that's a, well, great that's a point. good one. I Absolutely. Like it. Yeah. What about you, Kristen? And, and make sure you have treats, treats. The first time you put those little paws on, make sure <laughs> yeah. you have lots of treats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And okay. make sure you videotape their reaction too, because that is, <laughs> that's a worthwhile, that's a worthwhile That's the best film. part. Yeah. That's the best That's part. That's the best part. Okay. My product this week is from a company called Actify. I actually have it here with me today. You, you're um, holding it. Wow. I'm I'm holding it. Yes. And and I'm actually going to be doing some work with this company to educate people about, about the product and about its benefits. So it's called the Actify Hip and Joint Collar. They make one for dogs and one for cats. And what's super cool about this, and I don't think there's any other product like this, but it uses microtransdermal technology to deliver hip and joint supplements to your pet through the collar. So literally, like if I took it out of the box, it smells a little like kind of like like herbs or botanicals. It's not a bad smell. It's just and it kind of um, gets uh, lighter over time. But um, Tulip was wearing it the other day and it's super lightweight because it's just made of plastic. It's very durable. It's very adjustable too. I think, I know it comes in sizes, but even the sizes are, you know, very adjustable. But if you have a dog or a cat that is having joint, uh, joint 
issues, pain, arthritis, you know, any kind of degenerative condition, uh, this might be a really great option for you. Obviously, hopefully you're talking to your veterinarian about those issues because those are pain. Any pain your pet is experiencing can be very debilitating, not not only for their well-being and their quality of life, but also pets that are in pain tend to interact with us less. So it even harms the bond between pets and people. So, uh, but one thing I really like about this is that if you forget to give, uh, maybe you're already giving a joint supplement, but you have to give it every day or maybe twice a day. But if you forget and you've got this on, you know, that kind of fills in the gap or, or you don't even need to give the supplement via a treat if you're using the collar. So I thought that was a really cool, innovative product um, for a supplement that is really widely used among pet parents. Yeah, that's amazing. So it's it's like a it's almost like laced with a topical. Yeah, but it doesn't like I'm holding it now. There's nothing on it, like nothing comes off of it. It's just okay. the technology is a transdermal delivery system that essentially okay. kind of, you know, they're wearing it obviously on their neck. So it's getting absorbed by their skin into their system. So, and they yeah, actually so are similar are, to the flea and tick collars almost, but with yeah. a supplement. Wow. Similar that's concept. Great yeah. idea. And they're, they're working on a peer reviewed study that's going to be released soon to show the scientific evidence that it is effective. So check yeah, it so out. Maybe Actify. we'll talk about that on, on, on a future show. Sounds like a plan. Q and A's. All right, we are at the audience Q&A portion of the show, which Chris and I really love. We love to hear from you guys. And if you have a question, you can just visit petsadlife.org slash podcast, and you can either type in your question in the little form box, or you can click the audio button and leave us your audio message, which I think that'd be super cool because we, we'd love to hear your voice. Um, all right, Chris, you ready? Absolutely. Let it rip. Okay. This one's from Jonah in Minneapolis. And he says his family's considering getting a reptile as a pet, possibly a bearded dragon or a gecko. What are some key considerations that their family should keep in mind when choosing a reptile as a pet, especially when they have young children? Mm, that's a great question. So full disclosure, I've never kept a reptile. I've always been interested, but never kept one. But I did live with somebody who had uh, three leopard spotted geckos. So I, I know a little bit about what to expect. And I think my biggest piece of advice is don't underestimate the level of responsibility that is necessary to keep a reptile. Yes, it's less responsibility than your dogs and your cats and things like that, but it is still a, a daily responsibility. The feeding, yeah. the sunning, and the cleaning of the cage are all very involved tasks. So you, I don't think you can expect a, a younger child to clean a reptile cage properly. So that, that sounds like it's going to be a task for mom and dad. So just be aware of that. <laughs> um, the, yeah. the other part is, is these are not domesticated animals. We keep them as pets, but they are still uh, quite wild in nature. So it, this could be a great lesson for your young children in learning about boundaries um, and what mm -hmm. is an acceptable touch, what is an unacceptable touch. Um, handling a, a, a reptile can be unpredictable. You need to treat them with, with care and, and gentleness in order to receive that same energy back. Uh, so just be aware that accidents happen, bites happen, and the bites can, while, and, and this is another piece of advice, a bite can look like not a big deal because they have tiny little teeth, but it's not the wound you have to worry about. It's the possibility of infection. So another mm -hmm. point I would make is that if an accident does occur and there is broken skin, it's best just to go to a doctor immediately and have it checked out. Um, I've been bitten by animals before and I've had my whole hand swell up after saying, it's not a big deal. It's not a big <laughs> deal at all. Uh, and then meanwhile, my hand is turning into a mitten. So just be aware <laughs> of those risks, control those risks. And I'm sure uh, that this new uh, bearded dragon, gecko, whatever reptile you, you land on will be a great companion and a learning tool for your children. Yeah. And I, like you, Chris, I, I've never had a reptile as a pet. Uh, my nephew did have a bearded dragon and he was probably, I don't remember his exact age. I'm going to guess he was around five, maybe six at the time. And my sister did tell me later on that um, they had to rehome 
the bearded dragon because her son was actually kind of afraid of it. Um, it hadn't bitten him, but I think, you know, he loved the idea of having the pet, but then when it was actually in his room in, you know, in its enclosure, he, he was actually a little bit afraid of it. So, yeah. um, uh, just make sure everybody in the family is on board with it. Um, talk to friends or family who, who have experience with having reptiles in the home and, um, yeah. you know, before you make that important decision. That, that's a great comment with the bearded dragon, because you should show your kids a picture of the bearded dragon when it's frills are up, when it has the beard out. <laughs> Uh, because right. it looks a little bit like a dinosaur and that could be scary. Uh-huh. It could be cool. They could be like, yeah, that's really cool. I want that. But it could be scary. Uh, yeah. Another point I'll make with the geckos is they can drop their tails, which can be traumatizing to children. So oh, yeah. especially a young child is to grabbing me. <laughs> it suddenly, it will trigger an instinct for them to drop their tail, which means literally separate their tail from their body. And mm-hmm. that happened to one of my roommates, uh, old geckos in a, in a, a storm, a lightning storm, uh, made it anxious and it dropped its tail. Uh, and that could be traumatizing for a child who doesn't understand why that is a thing that they, that they do. So maybe some pre-education and anticipation into that would be good. So I have a question here for you, Kristen, uh, from Sophia out of Charleston, South Carolina, beautiful city. Hi, this is Sophia from Charleston. I've been thinking about volunteering at my local animal shelter. Great, Sophia. Uh, But I'm not sure what to expect. Could you share some insights on how best to prepare for volunteering and the types of activities I might be involved in? Yeah, absolutely. I like this question because I actually was part of the, of the volunteer program at the animal shelter where I used to work. Um, now, and I'm sure every shelter's uh, programs are different. But first of all, uh, what I would tell you is to – usually they will have a volunteer program set up or some in some type of format. So, Sophia, make sure you either read up about it online or contact their volunteer manager um, because the volunteer manager can explain to you what, explain to you what the different opportunities are for volunteers – you know, they might really need dog walkers or they might need people, you know, that will spend time with the cats or they might need people to clean cages. So, uh, you know, you certainly want to know what their needs are, but you want to make sure that what you're willing to do or what you're going to enjoy and commit to is something that's going to be fulfilling for you as well. So it has to really be a win-win. Um, you know, if you, if you, really want to walk dogs uh, so that the the shelter dogs are getting more exercise, but they assign you to cleaning kennels. I don't know. You might, might not stick with that program. I don't know. So uh, yeah, I would just say, find out about what, how the program works. If there's a certain commitment of time or a certain day of the week that they need, and then what are the opportunities that are going to align with what you would really like to do? But I think it's awesome that you're, that you're planning to do that. Yeah, that's great advice, Kristen. And Sophia, first off, thank you. Uh, for volunteering. Uh, The world needs more people like you. Uh, But what I would recommend is uh, set yourself up for success in terms of burnout. Uh, Don't overshoot your promise in what you're you're going to deliver to the shelter. Start with biweekly. Every other week, once a week, you come in and do something. And if you really love it and feel like you could fit more into your schedule, it is so much easier to build up and take on more commitment than it is to overcommit and try to shed some of that without feeling the need to quit it completely. So just th- think about that. Start off slow. Start off trying to find what you feel comfortable with. Um, and then if you feel like you could take on more, take on more. But until then, walk before you run. All right. Well, that's just about a wrap for our second show, Chris. So uh, I think it went really well. I hope you guys are learning some stuff and uh, and hope we're make- I hope we're making you laugh a little bit. I mean, I had a great time. Uh, If you like the show, be sure to rate and review the show. Leave us five stars. If you didn't like the show, leave us five stars anyway and tell us in the comments what we could improve on. If you want your question answered, petsadlife.org slash podcast. You can leave a voice memo or text us a question as uh, Sophia and Jonah did. Uh, You can follow us on all the socials. They're located there on the Pets Ad Life podcast page as well. And we hope you have a great rest of your week until you get to hear us again. Yeah, we'll see you next week.